All right, hi everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for the first live session from Ocean Sonics. My name is Rose and I am the marketing and PR person here at Ocean Sonics. So we regularly host lunch and learn sessions at our office, but these are irregular times, so we've taken the learning online. But the great part about these online sessions is now we can invite everyone to join us. So we'll be doing these live sessions regularly throughout the coming weeks and months. So keep your eyes on our social media feeds to see upcoming topics and sessions. So for everyone joining us today that is unfamiliar with Ocean Sonics, we are an ocean acoustics company. We're based in Nova Scotia on the east coast of Canada. And we created the IC Listen, which is a smart digital hydrophone. Um, this is a tool that is used to collect ocean sound data. And what makes it so special is that this hydrophone processes the data in real time so you can actively listen while the sensor is deployed. So on to today's topic, we will be discussing waterfall displays or spectrograms um, as they're often called. The software we used um, to display data is called Lucy and Ocean Fox created that. So you'll hear us refer to Lucy throughout the presentation, but there are other data processing softwares that produce waterfall displays and the science behind them is pretty universal. So Emma Carline will be leading today's session. Uh, she joined Ocean Sonics in 2018 as the acoustic algorithm developer. Uh, since joining Ocean Sonics, she's been working on a number of really cool projects, like developing a pinger localization technique for AUVs, and she deals extensively with spectral data. So, hi, Emma. Oh, goodness, Emma, can you hear us? Oh, Maybe not. Sorry, I think I lost you. <laughs> We'll just, uh, oh, there, we're back. Well, you know what? That is uh, the, the perks and the hazards of live streaming. So glad to have you back, Emma. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're going to talk about today? Sure, so I'm gonna talk about waterfall displays. Um, they're a very powerful way to display acoustic data. And there's a waterfall display in Lucy, as uh, Rose has mentioned. And so, yeah, I'm just going to talk about what this is and um, how it actually comes from the raw hydrophone data. Fantastic. So, Emma, after you finish your presentation, we are going to have a Q&A session. Um, some of you have already sent in questions for Emma. And if you want to know some more detail about what we've covered today, then you can leave a comment on our live stream feed. Um, or if you're not comfortable doing that, you can always send us an email. We'll give you our contact details at the end of the presentation. And uh, you can always email it in there. So um, without further ado, um, let's hop right into the presentation. So uh, let's uh, take it away, Emma. All right, let's bring up my presentation here. Okay, so Lucy and the waterfall display. So it's a plot. Um, if you ever use Lucy, it looks something like this. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what your experience has been with waterfall displays so far, um, but if you've ever used Lucy, um, it usually starts by you opening it up, adding acoustic data that's either on your computer or um, by connecting to a hydrophone. And then Lucy will display it. And so it's this lower plot, the colorful blue one, that is the waterfall display. And maybe it's confused you, you know, like what, what does it actually mean? Or maybe you really like it. Well, I hope this presentation helps you uh, love it even more. So why do we call it a waterfall display? Um, it's essentially because it does look like a waterfall. If you Google waterfall display, you'll get results about a new type of cell phone screen that sort of wraps around the phone, um, but that's not related to what we're gonna talk about. And as Rose has also mentioned, it's called a spectrogram. So where does it come from? Because after all, hydrophones, they're sensing a pressure wave. And sound is a traveling wave of changing pressures. 
These are picked up by the hydrophones um, because they have a piezo ceramic element in them that converts pressure to voltage. So it's at the end of the hydrophone uh, sensor tip there. And so what the hydrophones actually record is a voltage over time. And you can know some things from this data. Um, you know that loud sounds correspond to big changes in voltage and softer sounds correspond to smaller changes. Um, and if you know the sensitivity of the hydrophone, you can actually scale the data to get back um, the actual pressure of the sound wave. Um, but we don't just perceive the loudness of sounds. We actually know a lot about the quality of them. And one of um, these things is the pitch of sounds. It's really hard to see pitch in a pressure wave recording. And at the same time, we may not even be able to hear all of the pitches that are present in a recording. For instance, dolphins make clicking sounds that they start in our hearing range, but they also go well beyond our hearing range. So what we really want to be able to do is to see all of the pitches that are present in a sound and to see how those change over time. Um, so but stepping back, what even is pitch? Well, it's connected to pure tones, the sound that you would perceive as like a perfect tone. Now, if you plot their pressure wave, it turns out to be a perfectly sinusoidal uh, function. And pitch corresponds actually to the frequency of the sinusoid. So recall that frequency is the number of cycles that it makes in a second. Um, and the units for this are Hertz. So actually a, a lower frequency corresponds to a higher pitch, what we perceive as a higher pitch, and a higher frequency of the sinusoid corresponds to what we perceive as a higher pitch. And so I'll just play some of these sounds that I've uh, generated. They're pure tones starting at 300 Hertz. Hopefully you can hear that. We're going up to 400 Hertz. It's 500. And finally, that's 600. So you can see how as the frequency increases, uh, the pitch also increases. Um, but of course, natural sound is much more complicated than pure tones. Uh, pressure wave might look something like this, uh, which is quite messy and definitely not a pure sinusoidal wave. But somehow um, we still hear pitches in a sound. So what's going on is that our ears uh, in combination with our brain um, is able to decompose the sound into pure tones. And this allows us to perceive the pitches and the loudness of those pitches. So we'd like to do that with our hydrophone data. We'd like to see what pitches are present. So what we'll try to do is mathematically imitate what our ears are doing. So we're going to try to decompose sound wave um, as a sum of pitches or perfect tones. Uh, the good thing to know is that this is actually possible. There's a theorem that says that a sound wave can be expressed as a weighted sum of pure tones. Um, how do we actually calculate this? Well, the weights are given by the Fourier transform. So this is uh, the version for um, discrete data, so like sample data. Um, you don't have to really understand the equations. Um, the important thing is to know what's going on. Um, so you'll start with a, a pressure wave over time, and the Fourier transform will actually split it up into component frequencies, and it will determine how much of each frequency is present in the sound. And these are often plotted um, versus the frequency. So even better is the fact that there's a very fast algorithm to do this, um, to do this calculation. And you might have heard of it before. It's called the Fast Fourier Transform, the FFT. And it's actually used all over the place, not just in acoustics, um, 
but yeah, it's used for um, image compression and solving differential equations. So it really does make our lives good in ways that we probably don't even know. So how do we actually use the FFT to break down sound into its component frequencies? Well, we start with the sound. And suppose you have a digital hydrophone that's taking uh, measurements or samples um, FS times a second. We call this the sampling rate. Uh, so it has a bunch of samples here. Um, if we do the FFT on these samples, actually at first we get imaginary numbers. But um, if we take the magnitude squared of these imaginary numbers, this corresponds to the power of each frequency. So the magnitudes plotted against frequency look like this. And as you can tell, second half is actually a mirror image of the first half. So there's actually no new data, no new information in the second half. So we often um, actually combine it in a way um, to take, um, to get just um, the first half. Um, yeah, so the lower axis is the frequency. And well, what frequencies actually were used to decompose a sound wave. They start at zero, which you might expect. And the highest frequency though, that the sound wave gets decomposed into is related to the sampling rate of the hydrophone. So it's actually half the sampling rate. So it goes from zero to frequency of sampling rate over two. And maybe a little bit more on this because it's often confusing. So here's an example. If you have 1024 samples of wave data, so just a list of numbers really, um, and you know that the hydrophone sampling rate was 4096 samples per second. And if you take the FFT of this data, the FFT output is also 1024 samples. Uh, but as I've said, only the first half really contain information. Um, so how do we find, you know, what frequencies these this output corresponds to? So the frequency bands. Um, so we know that the last, the highest frequency is 2048 hertz because that's half of the sampling rate. And of course it starts at zero. Uh, what about all of the uh, bands in between? Well, we know there are 512 points in the output. So if we just divide that range by 512, we get that each frequency band has a width of four Hertz. So the next band after uh, the first one would start at four Hertz. The next one would start at eight, 12, and so on. Um, yeah, up to half the sampling rate. Uh, we'll do another kind of quick example um, with a, a real sound. So I've chosen a linear chirp uh, so a chirp is a sinusoidal wave, except that the frequency is increasing over time. And to have it increasing linearly from one up to five kilohertz over a course of five seconds. So I'll just play it here. Hopefully you can hear it. Okay. So that's the sound that we're going to be working on. A little late for that. Um, so if you plot it, um, plot its pressure versus time, it looks something like this. You can see it's sinusoidal in nature, but the frequency is increasing over time. Um, so we're going to use the sound to create a waterfall display. So. Um, the secret here is that the waterfall display is just a series of FFTs. So you'd start by breaking up your waveform into time segments, and then you would do the FFT on each one. So for the chirp, I've divided it up into five time seconds of one second each and taken a Fourier transform for each. To get to waterfall display, you then use color to represent power so instead of using the y-axis, you'd use color. So here, a lighter color corresponds to a higher power. So you can see the frequency is increasing over time. 
um, as the chirp goes up. And then finally, um, the FFTs are just displayed side by side in time. So they push together. Um, so this is a waterfall display of the chirp that you heard. So I've actually divided up into much shorter time segments just to make it a bit more fine. And you can see right away that this is a chirp, um, that it starts at a frequency of near zero and goes up to five kilohertz. Um, so yeah, it kind of shows how the waterfall display is a really useful tool, it tells you a lot about a sound um, very quickly. Uh, one thing to know is that there's a trade-off between the time and the frequency resolution of the waterfall display. So here's an example. The same data, um, but two different waterfall displays. So on the first one, we've taken fairly large time segments um, to do the FFT on. And so this has created actually a finer frequency resolution. In the second one, we took very short uh, time segments, and this has actually resulted in a coarser frequency resolution. Uh, so maybe a little more on this. Um, you can think of the waterfall display as kind of a grid. You can divide it up into the time segments, um, well, into pixels, really. Um, so time segments along the x-axis and frequency bins along the y. And so the key is that the number of time seg or samples in each time segment um, is equal to double the number of frequency bins. So for instance, if you had six samples in each time segment, you would end up with three frequency bins, but they always range uh, from zero up to half the sample rate. So this means that the frequency bins in this case are gonna be quite stretched out, quite large. Um, on the other hand, if you make the time um, segments longer, so more samples in each one, then you'll end up with more frequency bins. And so each bin will be actually shorter. So you'll have a finer frequency resolution. Yeah, so the first uh, frequency band um, for the left hand waterfall um, goes from zero up to a sixth of the sample rate. Whereas in the second one, where you have larger time segments, the frequency bins are smaller. Um, so the first one goes from zero up to 12, the sampling rate. Um, yeah, so what about Lucy? How does Lucy actually uh, choose the parameters for its waterfall display? Um, so it actually always uses 10, 24 points or samples in each time segment. So it divides up the acoustic data into um, segments of 10, 24 points. They're actually overlapping, which I don't really show. Um, then it does an FFT on each one. And then an extra step um, that doesn't always happen with waterfall displays is that Lucy actually averages the FFTs so that there's only one for each quarter second of data. So we actually, um, in a way, we've done a time average. And then it displays these side by side in time. And that is how we make our waterfall displays. That's what Lucy is actually doing. Um, so that's the end of our short presentation. Thank you so much for joining and listening. If you have any um, questions that came up during it, um, yeah, you can email me or Rose. Our emails are right here. I have included a few resources on the left-hand side here if you wanted to learn more about this topic. Um, the first one is kind of a general overview to you know, how we analyze sounds uh, from underwater data. Um, the second one is kind of a how-to, and if you wanted to create your own waterfall display in MATLAB, uh, if you were into programming a bit. And the last one is kind of more theoretical stuff about the Fourier transform. Yeah, so thanks for listening. Back to you, Rose. Well, thanks for that, Emma. Um, I, we're going to hop right in with a couple of questions. And the first one actually um, just popped up in our feed here. Um, yes, this will be recorded. Um, and we will be sharing the links to the video out uh, so that if anybody wanted to revisit 
what we discussed today, um, what Emma covered today. You can absolutely rewatch it a couple of times. Um, we'll share it on our social feeds. And also, I want to say thank you for bearing with us. I know we uh, we had a little bit of trouble going live initially, but um, perks of uh, live streaming, eh? <laughs> so let's hop into uh, one of the questions that was sent to us um, through our Instagram account. Um, someone has asked, uh, what are the key things to look at when reading a waterfall display? Right. Um, so the first thing, you know, you've got to get your bearing when you see it. Um, and to do that, you should definitely look at the axes. So look at what is the time axis, what is the frequency axis? So um, to know what time period you're looking at, how long it is, and also to see exactly what frequencies the plot is going to be showing, and maybe even you know like how coarse the bands are. Um, and then after that, you need to think about what you're looking for. So like say you're looking for you know blue whale vocalizations, um, you should look up what frequency range they call in. Um, so it turns out to be they are quite low frequency. So you'd know to look near the bottom of your spectrogram. Um, depending on the sample rate, um, to find your blue whale calls. Yeah, so it really depends what you're looking for. It's always like valuable to know um, some of like the time and frequency uh, info about the sounds that you expect to find. Yeah, that's a good question. Fantastic. Okay, so we have another question that was submitted through Instagram. Um, someone has asked, could you please discuss the usage of long-term spectral averages or LTSAs? Right. Um, so, yeah, actually, Lucy, in a way, is a long-term spectral average um, because of that extra step of averaging the FFTs over time. So the idea is, you know, what if you have a long period of data that you want to view in just one waterfall display? Well, you know, usually if you do the normal thing, you're just going to end up with too much data to actually display. Um, so the idea is with um, LTSA that you can just average some of the FFTs um, over time. And yeah, it's great because usually you don't want to see all the detail. You want to see the long term trends in the data. Um, so this will allow you to see sounds that are loud and occur fairly frequently. Um, you'll lose sounds that are very short in duration or maybe quiet compared to the rest. Um, but it's a very powerful way to summarize your data if you have a lot of it. Yeah, great. All right, so uh, keeping with the, the theme, um, we've also been asked, why use quarter second intervals? Right. So that was a choice um, by us, our software team. And um, it's actually based on human perception. So in Lucy, the waterfall display, it updates. It's really a video that moves across your screen in real time. And turns out that if you update it more than four times in a second, oh, our eyes can't keep up with it. Um, it'll be basically just confusing. So we choose to only update it four times a second, which corresponds to quarter second uh, time bins. Yeah, so that's where it comes from. Great, and we have another question here. Um, what are some data processing softwares that can be used to create waterfall displays? Okay, yeah. Um, so Lucy is a good choice, of course. Um, there's also a really great open source uh, one called Audacity um, that actually gives you a bit more control over um, how the spectrogram is done. So you can actually choose what size to make the time bins. Um, you can zoom in and out on the uh, waterfall display and change colors, um, change whether the axes are in log or linear. Um, so yeah, if you wanted to have a bit more control over the waterfall display, that might be a good choice. Um, also, it's very easy to actually code your own. Um, Python and MATLAB 
um, have functions that will actually do waterfall display for you. But of course, they let you choose the parameters of it. Um, yeah, so you can do that in just a few lines of code. So I used um, Octave, actually Python as well, to do a lot of the plots for this presentation. Cool. Yeah. Well, I think that is, those are all the questions that we have for now. Um, so thanks so much, Emma, for joining us. And again, if um, any of you have questions that you didn't get to ask, or even if there's a topic that you would like to see covered during some of these web sessions, please contact myself or Emma. Um, as you can see, our email addresses are there on that main screen. We'll leave them up there. So if you'd like to take a moment to jot them down, no problem. And uh, if you would like to revisit this presentation, like I mentioned previously, we will make this, avail uh, this video available on um, our social channels and we'll share the link around. Um, we will be doing this again regularly, so keep an eye on the social channels now that you know um, kind of how it works, how to join in. Uh, please feel free to join us anytime that we are hosting a session. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, and hopefully we'll see you uh, online again soon. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye.